frozen egg. And you were watching this program from the Facebook page of General Pharmaceuticals Limited and also from the YouTube channel of General Pharmaceuticals page. Learned audience, it is evident that type 2 diabetes is more than just a disorder of glucose metabolism. And SGL2 inhibitors, a newer class of oral antihyperglycemic drug is widely accepted worldwide for its beneficial outcome beyond managing high blood sugar. Among all SGL2 inhibitors, m has led to a paradigm shift in of patients with type 2 diabetes, and it has opened a new horizon in terms of beneficial cardiovascular and renal protective features. Moreover, uh, you know, American Diabetes Association, EASD, and CDA also recommended the combination of impagliflozin and metformin as first-line treatment for the patients whose hb one c level is more than 9%. So based on this evidence, we're going to arrange today's live webinar on impagliflozin metformin, fixed dose combination, new horizon in type 2 diabetes management. So first of all, let me introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Shahjid Selim, Associate Professor, Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism, BSMMU, and Organizing Secretary, Bangladesh Endocrine Society and ASAPD's chapter. Dr. Nice Selim has keen interest in clinical research in, in diabetes and its complications, yeah, prevention of diabetes, obesity, osteoporosis, and he has more than 100 articles published in international reputed journals. So let's welcome Dr. Shahjid Selim as keynote speaker. We are also delighted to welcome our respected panel of experts. Today, we have Professor Dr. A.K. Mohibullah, ex-director and professor in ICBD. He is also the president of the Society and vice president of Asian Pacific Society of Pharmacology. We also have Professor Dr. Shami Mahmed, ex-director and professor of nephrology, National Institute of Kidney Disease and Urology an ex-professor and head of nephrology at a medical college and hospital. We have Professor Dr. Khan Abdul Kalam Alisar, Principal, Dhaka Medical College and Professor, Department of Medicine, Dhaka Medical College and Hospital. Welcome to the program, sir. Dear audience, uh, we are very much honored and privileged to have Professor Dr. Zafar el Professor and former Director General Baden as our honorable chairperson of the webinar. Welcome to the program, sir. Uh, now, I'd like to ask for permission from today's chairperson, uh, Professor Dr. Jafar Latif, sir, for starting the session. Okay, you can start it. Thank you, sir. Dear audience, if you have any question or query regarding today's topic, you can put it in the comment section in, the, uh, in Facebook, and we'll be discussing after the presentation session. May I now request today's keynote speaker, Dr. Shahjad Selim, for the keynote speech on today's topic, Impactly-Pausin Metformin Fixed Dose Combination, New Horizon in Type 2 Diabetes Management. Dr. Shahjit Salim. Thank you, Dr. Sadia. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have the chairperson, Dr. Jafar Ahmed Latif Sad. Probably he's the teacher of almost all endocrinologists in Bangladesh. But for me, he's the uh, most important teacher in my endocrine life and uh, not only in the independent lab, he, I feel immense uh, obligation to him uh, to be guided in every aspect in the field of endocrinology. We have eminent, uh, most probably the most important eminent uh, experts from the three different specialties. Professor Sami Mahmoud sir, uh, he is uh, not to me, most of the students passed from the same medical college, uh, Sami Mahmoud sir was the most favorite student uh, teacher of, uh, to all students uh, for during his, his uh, presence in uh, Russia Medical College, and uh, we learned many things in nephrology from Hamid Ahmed Sir, uh, Mohibullah Sir, Professor Dr. Mohibullah Sir, very renowned endocrinologist, currently president of Cardiac Society, and I had uh, experience, present experience to work with him in NICBD. And uh, Professor Khan Abul Kalam Azad Sir, probably he is the most uh, favorite internist in the country and I also like him as my teacher, favorite teacher from Russia Medical College. So uh, I think this is very a uh, powerful, uh, heavy panel. And I am very much lucky to be with uh, these uh, four eminent professors to present my topic today. 
and the most beautiful part of this webinar, the uh, learned participants. I am giving you the uh, to think new things and the many questions you can arise, and the uh, panel uh, probably will satisfy your question. So the topic of today's discussion: uh, Emphagliflozin, metformin, big dose combination, new horizon in the management of type two diabetes mellitus. Uh, is it visible to you? Yes. Thank you. Uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus is in the hike. Uh, currently, we are passing through the COVID-19 pandemic, but before this, uh, we were in the uh, pandemic of uh, epidemic of type 2 diabetes mellitus declared by International Diabetes Federation uh, since 2012. Uh, this presentation, through the presentation, you all know the general pharmaceutical uh, sponsored presentation, and I will uh, cover the parts of the student's presentation as the prevalence of type 2 diabetes mellitus, pathophysiology, and the topic of discussion is DLT2 inhibitors and metformin, their pharmacokinetics and use in the type 2 diabetes mellitus, and at the end, the take home messages. This is very much uh, commonly cited slides from International Diabetes Federation. At the end of the 2019, in the ninth edition of the IDF Diabetes Atlas, they published that during this time, uh, the adults starting from 20 to 79 years, yeah. uh, in total, two, uh, 463 million of the this adult group had diabetes. And with the increased rate of 43%, at the end of 2045, the total number of patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, would be 7 100.2 million. And the increase that is not similar, it's very, very, depending upon the geography, uh, geographical regions of the world, we can see that the, it is most, uh, most highest in the African region. Uh, one thing we should, we should keep in mind that the 143% increase, this is not only the new case, this is a new case and newly detected case in total 143. Next to this African region, uh, Middle East and North African region, the MENA region has 96% increase. Next to that, the Southeast Asian region, the region we, the Bangladesh we belong to, we had the third highest increase rate of uh, diabetes, 74%. And more importantly, we can find that the European region has only 15% increase from 2019 to 2045. What Bangladesh, where Bangladesh stands, you can see here. Uh, in the uh, ninth edition of International Diabetes Federation uh, Atlas uh, de depicted that Bangladesh had the 10th position in 2019, uh, according to the total number of patients with diabetes, but the condition is deteriorating. Uh, they postulated that in 2030 and 2045, Bangladesh will have the ninth position, depending upon the total number of diabetes mellitus. So we should be very much keen in uh, treating our patients with diabetes, not only diabetes, also other comorbidities. According to uh, the same diabetes atlas, we can find that the huge number of patients with diabetes will have cardiovascular diseases. One important information is that around 68 to 75% patients with type 2 or type 1 diabetes mellitus has the rate, uh, mortality due to uh, cardiovascular disease. So uh, we have the frequency of different categories of cardiovascular disease. The prevalence of cardiovascular disease during this time, it was uh, any cardiovascular disease, 32%, coronary heart disease, 21%, myocardial infarction, 10%, and stroke, 7.6%. The impact, the, the, the increase will be coronary heart disease, 160%. Ischemic heart disease 127%, hemorrhagic stroke 56%, cardiovascular disease 132%, and year of life lost due to diabetes and cardiovascular disease at 5.8 years from the age of 50, 6.8 years from the age of 50 for women and 5.8 for men. So the we cannot compare the uh, life expectancy loss by any other uh, parameters. Now. Uh, very briefly, I am going to pathophysiological uh, and the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Why type 2 diabetes mellitus develops in a person? Uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus is a cumulative effect 
of insulin resistance and insulin secretory defect before developing uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus at least 12 to 15 years prior to development of type 2 diabetes mellitus the patient has insulin resistance and it is going up when patient has a type 2 diabetes mellitus at least 10 to 12 years before the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, it is demonstrated in the UKPJ study that the patient has declined insulin secretion. So we can see here that the insulin resistance has gone up. Insulin secretion primarily uh, to respond to insulin resistance, if, if the pancreas is capable of producing excess amount of insulin, there will be hyperinsulinemia, but very soon the pancreas will not be able to cope up with the insulin resistance and insulin secretion will decline and patient will enter in the uh, pre-diabetes, then diabetes. According to the same graph, we can see that initially there will be postprandial hyperglycemia followed by uh, fasting hyperglycemia. But again, very important thing to, me, to remember that the insulin effect will also decline. So the patient will have a high level of insulin resistance with increasing level of postprandial and preprandial blood sugar with decline insulin level and increasing effect. And this will continue. The postprandial blood sugar will go to the sky and next to the postprandial, the fasting blood sugar, but the insulin level tends to, to tend to go to the zero level with, uh, uh, along with the incating effect. So this is the uh, chronological graph. But again, one, uh, the very commonly, again, commonly cited the ominous, ominous octet, the multiple complex pathophysiological abnormality in type 2 diabetes mellitus. This is very much uh, pertinent to, to recall for the management of diabetes mellitus to accommodate it with the pathophysiological changes that occurred in the patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, this is a uh, pancreatic beta cell dysfunction to produce insufficient insulin. Not only that, one thing we very often uh, forgot, they forget that the, the patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus, the pancreatic beta cell dysfunction is there, but the pancreatic alpha cell almost intact. So there will be arm opposed activity of pancreatic uh, alpha cell producing glucagon. The, the same effect will also be observed in the other parts. The insulin uh, resistance will uh, decrease the uh, inward transport of glucose in the peripheral tissues, especially in the muscle and adipose tissue. And that will initiate excess amount of gluconeogenesis, excess rate of gluconeogenesis from the liver. Uh, all, uh, behind the all of the steps, brain will be the main player. Not only that, but gut have the immense effect. Uh, so the gut hormone should be addressed. And uh, not only, only the gut hormone, kidney is also very much important. We, today we have, will very, uh, uh, we'll try to focus on that part. So depending upon the pathophysiological impact of into the, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus development, many of the drugs have been develop targeting every pathophysiological abnormality. We can see that insulin to uh, replace the insulin deficiency, vinite and sulfonylurea to secret excess insulin, the uh, glucagon antagonist, amylin myomidase has been there. The, uh, the, the thiazinogen region will decrease the insulin resistance the peripheral tissue. Metformin is also more, more important one. That will also decrease the insulin resistance and decrease the uh, gluconeogenesis from the liver, bile acid secretion can be used to decrease the uh, gluconeogenesis from the liver, alpha glucosidase inhibitor, GLP-1 receptor agonist, and dp 4 inhibitor all has the effect on the gut hormones. Now, today's topic of discussion, one of them, the HDL2 inhibitor, uh, I am coming in detail to that. So the, this is a new dimension, uh, decreasing glucose from the blood, uh, patient blood without handling the pancreas. This is a new concept. Uh, what, what is the uh, basic principle of the concept? Uh, glucose is reabsorbed from the kidney tubules, around 90% from the uh, loop of healthy. This is the proximal part and distal part in about the 10%. Uh, and this is sodium glucose co-transporter dependent uh, reabsorption of glucose. So if one person has the uh, antagonist activity against the HDLT2 or T1, that will decrease the reabsorption of glucose. So this glucose will go uh, uh, excrete so urine. So this 90% uh, of the 
90% of total glucose reabsorption can be inhibited by sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor and 10% by sodium glucose, uh, glucose co-transporter inhibitor 1. But one thing uh, for diabetes patient is important that the 180 milligram, the renal threshold, this can be increased by threefold, uh, 420 to 600 milligram in patients with diabetes because there is a progressive decline of uh, glucose supply to the cell. So the cell will accommodate to have the uh, sufficient glucose. So when the reabsorption is inhibited, the huge number amount of glucose will be inhibited to reabsorb from the kidney tube. Several effects are there. I am uh, not going to in details. I am coming to the important uh, effects of the HDL tube inhibitor. It will increase uh, insulin sensitivity in muscles by increasing uh, glucose translocation and insulin signaling. It will in insulin sensitivity in the liver will be decreased by glucose cis phosphate uh, deficiency. Gluconeogenesis will be decreased by decreasing choline cycle and PEP carboxy. Uh, carboxykinase and improved beta cell function will be also observed in patients with uh, SGLT2 inhibitor users. The total effect that has been uh, provided by use of SGLT2 inhibitors are uh, shown in that table. It is a huge table. I am coming the most important one the direct uh, metabolic effect that it will also not only uh, increase the uh, excretion of glucose and decrease the glucose from the uh, body, but also it will also increase the activity of glucagon. Uh, the cumulative effect is the increased glucosuria, decreased HPA1C, decreased glucotoxicity, decreased insulin resistance, decreased body weight and visceral adiposity, increased uricosuria, uh, decreased oxidative stress, decreased inflammatory machinery markers and vascular dysfunction. Oxidative diuresis will be there. Every molecule will go, will go out, which also accompany with the sodium, one molecule of sodium and water. So there will be uh, osmotic diuresis and net diuresis that will increase erythropoietin levels, increase hemoglobin and hematocrit, increase tissue oxygen delivery. It will also decrease the plasma volume, intestinal fluid volume, blood pressure, vascular stiffness, preload and afterload. Uh, vascular congestion and cardiac, cardiac wall stiffness that every uh, thing will increase the cardiac efficiency. The direct renal effect that the, uh, initially uh, we, are, we are very much doubtful that the, the increased level of glucose excretion may have the deteriorating function on kidney glomerular membrane, but uh, study found that the, the glomerular pressure will decrease, uh, albuminuria will decrease, renal growth and inflammatory marker will go down and restore the uh, tubular glomerular feedback and inhibition of NH3 activity. So preservation of the renal function by decreasing uh, progression of uh, decreasing progression of albuminuria and decreasing oxygenation of the nephropathy. So it is a uh, nephroprotective uh, drug. We can find that. A direct cardiac effect that can be uh, observed that the, the metabolic shifting, it will decrease the free fatty acid oxidation, increase uh, glucose oxidation and uh, BASOB oxidation and increase uh, P of the core ratio and the inhibition of NHE1 activity and decrease cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis and demoraging that in total it will increase the cardiac efficacy. So uh, the study uh, found results I'm coming in details later on but it can increase the three-point uh, cardiac events and increase heart failure in the patient. So it is also cardioprotective in the patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus. The pharmacokinetics of uh, three HDLT2 inhibitors, currently there are uh, four uh, or five HDLT2 inhibitors available in the other parts of the world, but in Bangladesh, we are having three, the canagiflozin, dafagiflozin, and empagiflozin. Bioavailability of canagiflozin is about 65 percent, defagiflozin 62, and empagiflozin more than 60 percent. Peak plasma time one to two hours for canagiflozin, two hours to three hours in defagiflozin, and empagiflozin for 1.5 hours. Protein binding 99 percent for canagiflozin, 91 for defagiflozin, and 86.2 percent for empagiflozin. Volume of distribution 90, uh, 119 for liter for canagiflozin. 118 for DAFA and 73.8 uh, liter for 
m vasoclozin half life this is important uh, 10.6 to 13 hour for canaxoclozin uh, 12.9 for dapagliflozin and 12.4 for m vasoclozin uh, what glycemic effect we can observe in a, in a patient with uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus who is using the hdlc2 inhibitor so if we compare the uh, with the uh, monotherapy of m vasoclozin with uh, Add on to metformin, add on to pyoxetazone, metformin, we add on to metformin, salmonellaria, add on to vasoinsulin. Very uh, fascinating result, we can see that the monotherapy group that has used the uh, empagiprozin, the reduction of fasting blood sugar with 10 milligram, it was 13.20 uh, milligram per TL, it is about 1.73 millimole per liter, and uh, 25 milligram uh, 36.2, that is about uh, 2.01 uh, milli, millimole per liter. So it is very uh, prominent effect on uh, fasting hyperglycemia reduction. What about the postprandial? We can see that the uh, postprandial uh, hyperglycemia reduction it is uh, more than by the 10 milligram over the 25 milligram. And the, and the uh, according to uh, comparing with the placebo, the difference is very significant. And very importantly, we usually uh, Glycemic effect is observed in the uh, clinical practice by HbA1c. The HbA1c reduction with monotherapy, uh, add on to metformin and metformin salmonellaria, we can see that the, with monotherapy it is 3.7 percent. With uh, metformin it is 3.23. With uh, salmonellaria uh, it is 2.89. So, uh, we, what are the studies? Is that several studies have been uh, finished and several studies are ongoing. I am coming with a very important one, the EMPA race trial, the one of the most le important landmark trials that has been conducted in the field of type 2 diabetes mellitus. It uh, screened more than uh, 11,000 patients and 7,020 patients have been randomized and more than 97% completed the trial. This, this was a placebo controlled randomized trial and in, it, it has been conducted in many countries with uh, the multi-center uh, fashion. Uh, the baseline characteristic of the study participant was more than 50% had the type, uh, more than 10 years of diabetes duration, more than 25% has the less, has less than 60 millimole per, milli per uh, 1.73 meter square of body surface area, around 93% patient has albuminuria, uh, 99% patients had free existing cardiovascular diseases. Among them, more than 75% had coronary artery disease, more than 46% had history of MI, around 10% had heart failure. A background standard of care therapy, this is uh, American Diabetes Association uh, standard of care of management of type 2, uh, type two diabetes mellitus. Around more than 48% patients were receiving insulin. More than 80 percent uh, received AC inhibitor or ARB. More than about uh, more than 76 percent were on statins, and around 89 percent patient received anti-fluorescent agent. The fascinating result that has been found in Empire's trial, you can find the key point may be the, the non-fatal MI, uh, the uh, ischemic uh, unstable angina, or uh, cardiovascular death. This is a decreased relative risk reduction was 14 percent and absolute risk reduction 1.6 percent uh, cb mortality reduced uh, relative risk reduction by 38 percent and absolute risk reduction by 2.2 percent hospitalization for heart failure reduced by 36 percent absolute relative risk reduction and uh, absolute risk reduction by 1.4 percent hospitalization for heart failure or cb mortality relative risk reduction by 34 percent and absolute 2.8 percent Incident, incident or worsening nephropathy, uh, relative risk reduction by 39% and absolute risk reduction by 6.1%. More than 40% sustained decline in GFR, uh, relative risk reduction 45%, absolute 1.4%. All cause mortality reduced by 32% relative risk reduction and 2.6% absolute risk reduction. Uh, uh, one, around one hour. Uh, prior to this program, very recently, the Frontier uh, Diabetes uh, Frontier in Medicine published this uh, review article. This study compared the uh, risk of renal outcomes among patients with C 
CKD treated with HDL2 inhibitor. They compared the results of 10 studies. I am uh, only come, uh, uh, reading the most important one, the Empire trial. We can see that the improved of incidence or worsening of nephropathy, uh, the result I have shown you that the Canvas study that found that the canagliflozin was also associated with a lower rate of progression of albuminuria. The declared TME 58 study, the incidence of the renal composite outcome was 4.3% in the dapagliflozin group and 5.6% in the placebo group. The Hartis CV study, the renal composite uh, outcome was 3.9 versus 3.9. So this is also important. The credence study, the ESRD, a doubling of serum creatinine, renal or cardiovascular death for canagliflozin versus placebo was 43.2 versus 64. 61.2 per 1,000 patients. So uh, several study also had the similar uh, results. So I'm not re reading all the study results. Now, what is the place of type two uh, management, type two diabetes management and HDLT2 inhibitor? The most robust guideline currently uh, in practice in many parts of the world, including Bangladesh, uh, we can find that the patient who have the uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, the lifestyle modification, and metformin is the first line therapy, pharmacotherapy. Then, patients who have the high risk of cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular event, for those patients, ACVD or uh, indic indicators of high risk of cardiovascular disease, for those patients, GLP on agonist or HGLP2 inhibitor is the preferred option. But if the patient is having a heart failure, particularly uh, reduce the rejection factor heart failure for those patients, HDLT2 inhibitor is the preferred one. Patient who had the CKD, the, for those patients, if EGFR more than 30, for HDLT2 inhibitor is the uh, preferred drug to start with. But if the patient is uh, compelling needs to minimize hypoglycemia for those patients along with DP4 inhibitor, GLP1, fructose agonist, hydrogenation, HGLT2 inhibitor is also important one. But if the patient has is having compelling need to weight loss, so for those patients, the most important one is the GLP1 fructose agonist along with lifestyle modification. But HGLT2 inhibitor is also important one. So uh, the very important position. But the paradigm shift of guideline of using HGLT2 inhibitor has been made by uh, 2019. European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, they said that the patient who are having the high risk of cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular event or had the cardiovascular event for those HDLT2 inhibitor with the lifestyle modification with the primary drug. But if the patient is having BMI more than 30 kg per meter square, for those patients, metformin can be used. So the robust indication of HDLT2 inhibitor in type 2 diabetes mellitus, we can find that the overweight or obesity, hypertension, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease predominant patient, heart failure or CKD predominant patient, compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia, contraindication to other drugs or intolerance to other drugs. So there are uh, several other indications as well. But uh, while using a drug, we have to very much cautious. Uh, especially in patients with uh, DKD, AD, according to AD and other recommendations, if the EGFR is above 30, we can use the uh, drug, but if it is below 30, we cannot, we should not use. Uh, at the end of the May 2021, a very good review article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they have the, uh, have compared the all drugs that has been in use to treat diabetes, diabetes mellitus and the property of those drugs to reduce the cardiovascular mortality uh, starting from the primary or secondary endpoint. We can see that with the primary endpoint, the empagliflozin and canagliflozin meet the primary outcome and secondary outcome and dapagliflozin uh, primary outcome and r 2 glyphosin this is not available in Bangladesh at the secondary outcome of cardiovascular uh, outcome in, in their studies. So uh, the uh, multiple cardiovascular disease risk factor reduction that has the, also the empagliflozin and dapagliflozin has the similar study outcome. Another uh, heart failure with reduced injection fraction, DAPA and empagliflozin has the primary outcome. So the convincing result we have observed in several studies. 
albuminuric chronic kidney disease patients the can be present the has the secondary outcome and primary outcome and they achieve the outcome that the study has convincing results to use the drug to uh, re reduce the albuminuric chronic kidney disease progression so again uh, adversity to genital urinary ur ur tract infection when the drug came in market there is uh, suspicion by the physician that that can increase the chances of having a uh, urinary tract or genital infection but uh, several studies found that there is no statistical significant association with that even then we should be very much cautious uh, the patient should practice good uh, personal hygiene patient should consume adequate water and the patient if is having several episodes of urinary tract infection uh, we should not start the drug for those one another the volume depletion as the uh, glucosuria along with water will cause volume depletion so the patient who are using this drug should be advised to take adequate water and the patient who are using the diuretic along with the other anti hypertensive drug the diuretic part should be stopped uh, the this effect will be provided by hgl to be inhibitor now another uh, fascinating drugs to be used in type 2 diabetes mellitus or in other occasions i am coming to this one this metformin the metformin is the first line pharmacologic treatment for type 2 diabetes mellitus the most commonly prescribed drug in the many parts of the world it is used either alone or in combination with other drugs it is in use since 1957 starting from france and has more than 73 years of clinical experience it was the fourth most commonly prescribed medication in usa in 2019 and with more than 80 million prescription alone so what does uh, metformin do in the body it it uh, inhibit the uh, mitochondrial respiratory chain complex 1 it activate the ampk kinase activity it, it also decrease the glucokinase activity and uh, gluconeogenesis from the liver and it also stimulate peripheral utilization of glucose by uh, muscle and uh, adipose tissue so it also has has an insulin sensitizing effect with multiple actions of tissue including liver skeletal muscle endothelial adipose tissue and ovary ever as patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus has three times the normal rate of gluconeogenesis and metformin treatment reduces the risk by over one third metformin exerts direct beneficial effect on beta cell function such as insulin release transcriptional regulation in pancreatic islet and islet cell viability being dependent on the presence of glucose it can effectively avoid hypoglycemia several studies found there the metformin has the prominent dominant cardiovascular protective uh, effect uh, this is ukpda 34 the coetol uh, presto etol donson etol uric etol uh, evans etol and this this all study found that the metformin has the important effect to reduce microvascular macrovascular and in the long run cardiovascular death in the patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus so how we can use the pharmacokinetics of this drug it is taken orally absorbed so gi spread not metabolized at all and excreted on stains in the urine so concern of renal function is there so metformin indications uh, in type 2 diabetes mellitus to reduce insulin requirement in patients who are requiring high uh, volume of insulin uh, used to uh, address the good glycemic control and can be combined with all the drugs used in uh, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus management it can be also used in polycystic ovary syndrome uh, to reduce insulin resistance but very importantly it is one of the important uh, ovulation induction and uh, inducing drugs certain malignancies have has the indication to use to reduce especially in colorectal carcinoma breast carcinoma and many more so uh, while using we should be very much uh, cautious about the adverse effect which is not uh, very infrequent around 10 to 15% patient may have adversity and around 6% patient may not tolerate uh, the adversities are anorexia nausea vomiting diarrhea metallic taste loss of weight skin rashes lactic acidosis 
it is almost a theoretical problem. Very uh, rarely you can find in the clinical scenario. And the chronic use of vitamin uh, metformin uh, can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. So if any patient is having uh, symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, for those patients, the ADA recommendation is to measure uh, vitamin B12 status and uh, vitamin B12 supplementation may be needed. So I'm for dead. addressing this patient, we should start low dose and escalate dose depending upon the patient response. And contraindication, the so, oil debated area is general failure. So the current statement from American Diabetes Association, if the patient is having EGFR more than 40, full dose of metformin can be given. And if their EGFR fall between 30 to 45, half of the maximal dose can be given. But if the patient is having acute or advanced liver disease or gut disease in this time, we cannot use this one. Uh, for alcohol abusers, the, that can cause even uh, hypoglycemia. During pregnancy, we cannot start this one. And acute gut related problems during this time, we should not use the drug to, uh, in type 2 diabetes in the right time. Now, coming to the combination, these two, these two most beautiful drugs in market, we can combine to have the beneficial effect. What are the evidences? The initial combination of infagipulosin and metformin in patients with type 2 diabetes malata, this is study published in Diabetes Care by Sami Hadjad. Uh, they had the objective to compare the efficacy and safety of initial combination of amphagipresin and metformin with amphagipresin and metformin monotherapy. And they came out this, with this brilliant results. We can find that the patient who, who received metformin alone uh, at a dose of 500 milligrams twice daily, the HBNC reduction was 1.18%. And for 1,000 milligrams twice daily, it is it was 1.75 percent. Patient who used amphagiprozine 10 milligram once daily, the reduction of HPNC was 1.35, and for 25 milligram 1.36. That the patient who had the combination of metformin and amphagiprozine, 5 milligram amphagiprozine and 500 milligram metformin twice daily, uh, the reduction of HPNC was 1.98. For 500 milligram and 1,000 milligram metformin, the reduction of HBNC was 2.07%. And 125 milligram and 500 milligram metformin, it was 1.93. And 12.5 milligram and 1,000 milligram metformin twice daily, it was 2.08. Reduction of HBNC was observed in the study. And more importantly, the reduction of HBNC was stable for patients who received emphasis metformin combination comparing with the uh, patient who received metformin alone. Now, uh, another uh, component, there are several components of the study. I am coming with a very important component. The change in the body weight, we find that with metformin, the reduction of body weight was 0.5 by 500 milligram twice daily, 1.3 kg by 1,000 milligram twice daily, empagiplodin 10 milligram reduced 2.4 and 25, 2.4. And amphagiprozine metformin, 5 milligram over uh, 5 milligram plus 500 milligram metformin reduced 2.8, 500 milligram and 1000 milligram metformin twice daily, uh, 3.5 kg, 12.5 milligram amphagiprozine, 500 milligram metformin twice daily reduced 6 kg. And uh, the most uh, beautiful and most important findings of the 12.5 milligram and 1000 milligram metformin, this was. 3.8 kg over the 24 weeks of study previous duration. And again, the uh, weight reduction was stable with the amphagiprozine metformin than metformin alone. And uh, the comparison of the side effects with amphagiprozine metformin combination, amphagiprozine alone, and metformin alone, there was no significant adversity observed in that study. So this study concluded by saying that. Amphagiprozine and metformin for 24 weeks significantly reduced HPA1C versus amphagiprozine once daily and metformin twice daily without increasing hypoglycemia, reduced weight versus metformin twice daily, and were oil tolerated. So at the end, we can say that the combination of amphagiprozine metformin in a fixed dose fashion in a single tab tablet can be useful to treat patients. Uh, with type 2 diabetes mellitus who are inadequately controlled with metformin and need to progress to dual therapy. And this option may be 
particularly suitable for patients who would benefit from additional uh, bene bene uh, benefits of modest BP and weight reduction, as well as individuals with, uh, with risk of cardiovascular disease and declining of renal function. The single field combination could also simplify therapy and potentially improve clinical outcomes compared with com co administration of individual tablets. So, the patients who are having uh, diabetes, hypertension, or other cardiovascular diseases, or obesity, they are uh, on several drugs. So, if we can combine several drugs in a fixed dose combination that will reduce the number of drugs, that will similarly increase the compliance by the patient, that will again have the uh, good outcome of the patient in the terms of glycemic control, weight reduction, and cardiovascular protection. So thank you all for your patient sharing. As we are in the uh, probably third wave of COVID pandemic, so stay home, stay safe, and uh, I, at the end, I also very much grateful to you all for uh, serving the patient. And I bestow my uh, esteemed respect to the physician and other health workers and the uh, person who dedicated their work and uh, sacrificed their life for the management of COVID patient in the world. Thank you all. Thank you, sir, uh, for the Technical Thank you very much, sir. Uh, for your nice presentation. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. Hey, Dr. Shambhak, I want to say something about the disease itself. Diabetes is a multifactorial disease, not a single disease. There are so many factors are involved. But whatever factors it may be, ultimately it is the insulin and insulin sensitivity is the main culprit. In a physiological condition, the amount of insulin secreted in our system is not there when there is diabetes. At the diagnosis of diabetes, about 50% beta cell is exhausted. This is number one. So natural history is that whatever treatment modalities that we give, previous, used to give previously, used to work for three to five years as proved by UKPDS study. After three to five years, every patient needs insulin. That was the problem because beta cell exhaustion. We stimulate the beta cell by sulfonuria, by glenide, or so many other things. But now the question is that if you can do something 
विच विल प्रिवेंट द डिले ऑफ बीटा सेल एग्जॉर्शन नंबर वन और बीटा सेल कैन बी रिजेनरेटेड अगेन टू ए फिजियोलॉजिकल कंडीशन दिस इज टू कंडीशन नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज दैट when there is diabetes already the patient is having diabetes so many studies including ukpds dcct komamoto and many other diseases the studies proved beyond doubt by good glycemic control microvascular complication can be started to a significant number but not macrovascular disease that is only 16% proved in ukpds study there is improvement there the macrovascular disease that means ischemic heart disease is a multifactored again it is not the diabetes alone we shall have to take care of other factors as well so and the third one is the cardiovascular disease is the major killer of diabetes mellitus a patient doesn't die of kidney disease in that much maybe not more than that of a normal person non diabetic person but alarmingly more than 100% or 130 50 60% death are due to diabetes in cardiovascular disease in diabetic patient so keeping this to i think if you think in mind if we think that the major killer and of diabetes is ischemic heart disease and we we can save the beta cell from total exhaustion how can i do that first one is that if we don't stimulate the beta cell if we can sensitize more the available insulin in the system how can we sensitize it we can sensitize by preventing uh, by uh, prescribing metformin which causes reduce reduce the insulin resistance so by reducing the insulin resistance of the available insulin in the system beta cell is less stimulated this is number one function of metformin last one is that if i can drive away the excess sugar into urine so that will not also stimulate beta cell so beta cell exhaustion will be delayed by metformin as well as hgl2 inhibitor so beta cell will be preserved for longer period of time if we can save the beta cell for the longer period of time the need of insulin will be delayed otherwise patient most of the patient as i said earlier need insulin in 3 to 5 years time or maybe 5 or 6 years time or 7 years time they need insulin for their circulation so as it is a multifactorial disease insulin resistance kidney is involved liver is involved so many factors are is there and there is about i say already eight factor octet ominous octet so by prescribing a metformin and hglt together we are not stimulating beta cell so maybe some of the beta cell function may be regenerated or if not regenerated completely the exhaustion of beta cell will be delayed that is one of the achievement and simultaneously dr sajata said so clearly the sgt2 has other advantage of lowering blood pressure lowering dyslipidemia and lowering body weight all the metabolic component of cardiovascular diseases are been taken care by metformin and sgt2 so this combination is a very good combination and i think and that will be very helpful in a definitely in a very significant group of patient thank you very much dr jada sanim for your presentation now i shall request dr mehibulla to say something about or uh, comment about the uh, uh, presentation uh, <coughs> respected chairperson and the honorable uh, faculties uh, by this time our speaker very nicely and elaborately explain the informative presentations as well as the chairperson has explained the thing most of the things by this time uh i have to told i i have to say that the type 2 diabetes mellitus 
is increasing throughout the world, including Bangladesh, and it has an increasing risk of macro and microvascular complications. Uh, moreover, uh, it may produce mitral dysfunction and ultimately a heart failure, even in the absence of the other risk factors like hypertension, coronary artery diseases, and this special entity, entity is known as diabetic cardiomyopathy. And it has been found that the use of amphotericin in type 2 diabetes significantly improves the arterial stiffness and vascular resistance in addition to control of diabetes mellitus. Uh, it has been beneficial effect in myocardial oxygen consumption, which ultimately reduces the ventricular wall tension. Uh, it also reduces blood pressure, which in other way reduces cardiac workload. So we can conclude that the use of empagliflozen is effective in improving cardiovascular complications as well as in controlling the type 2 diabetes mellitus. I am very much thankful to the chairperson and the faculties and the general pharmaceuticals for inviting me here in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you once again. Sir, I have a special word. Sir, I have a word uh, with my family, so I have to leave now. Thank you very much, sir, if you permit. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can I, can I hear from Dr. Thana Bulkala Majad, please? Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. My respected thank teacher, you, Professor Jafar Elatif, he is not only the teacher, but you know that uh, when endocrinology was, uh, you know, in embryo, and at the time, people understanding, all the understanding by the doctors, the students, was, you know, not too much, uh, you know, at the time, Professor Zafir Latif, I found him that he's moving from one medical college to another and explaining the details of diabetes mellitus at the time. At the time, I completed my FCPS examination, but I should confess that even at that time, I was not very much rich about diabetes mellitus because many and many information were coming in about diabetes mellitus. Well, we were knowing diabetes mellitus and really we saw that, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ocean. So at the time, Professor Jafar Latif sir was very kind enough to move from one place to another to teach the students about diabetes mellitus and he's chairing the session. Uh, I like to say my respect to my great teacher, Professor Jafar Latif. And also we found two great teachers of the country you know, when the cardiology was, you know, a very small subject at the time, Professor Mohibullah, uh, he was talking a little earlier, and he was there to make cardiology a real subject. And today we understand that what cardiology means. Whenever you talk about a medical illness, it means cardiology should be there. And the second organ, that is your kidney, Professor Dr. Shamim, also when we found that there was none in nephrology, to treat patients with having a huge number of patients with renal problems, either primary or secondary disorders at the time, Professor Shamim and other teachers uh, were there and they became the teacher of the subject. So I'm very much pleased and very happy and I feel honored to be with these great teachers, all these three teachers in the same platform. And to talk about today's speaker, Dr. Shahzada Salim, he is really a really silent observer, but you know, his brain was so sharp and the way he started studying the things and a very good researcher. He has got so many questions in his mind and he is a very good presenter. And I attended several presentations uh, of Dr. Shahzada Salim and today it was an excellent presentation. So much evidence based that I have truly say that Dr. Shahzada Salim has really made this program a very successful one. And the presence of these three teachers, it means that the, the program should be a very effective one. And 
the evidence based uh, you know talking of dr shahzada salim made it possible and really it glorified the session uh, uh, by uh, dr shahzada salim and also i like to give thanks to general pharmaceuticals for their this scientific endeavor uh, when i was invited and really i'm very you know honored i feel privileged to be here uh, in such a webinar to to talk about the issue is that the background for choosing this topic was described by our honorable friend, chairperson professor jafar alati that what diabetes is what insulin is and what the oral anti diabetic agents are and how to save the pancreas how to work in other ways and so that and as dr shahzad asim showed the different drugs which are working and to talk about this one sentence made by professor jafar latif in one of the sessions he said insulin is the best treatment and other forms of treatment may be needed and we understand that that type 1 it is the insulin type 2 you know after exhaustion of the pancreatic beta cell you may need insulin within 3 to 5 years and so that treatment is insulin but in our country and also in some other countries we see that insulin treatment may be unsuccessful why because of so many reasons you know that people they do not like to uh, uh, make a puncture into the skin they don't want to store the insulin in proper side and once insulin is finished they take several uh, days or months even to procure new insulin and also may not be that desired insulin is available everywhere and also uh, requiring high and high amount of insulin and prescribed by the doctors may make the patient unhappy and he is reluctant to take insulin and also the route is important and the people like to take orally so for this reasons oral anti diabetic agents are the preferred one in most of the diabetic patient and also the doctors they like to prescribe in most of the outpatient patients without any complication and because we know that anti diabetic agents orally also they have got many many potential beneficial effects especially the cardiovascular outcome and also the renal outcome we need all this anti diabetic agents so here the topic was that metformin and uh, empagliflozin we understand that uh, uh, metformin when we were the students metformin was a little bit neglected everybody used to say okay there may be lactic acidosis but truly speaking also another sentence from professor dr jafar latif he never saw any lactic acidosis after metformin so lactic acidosis from your sepsis or some other thing are far more common than uh, after taking your metformin so we understand uh, after afterwards the how popular this metformin became to reduce the uh, uh, side effects of your uh, uh, diabetes mellitus and also to control blood glucose adequately in diabetic patient so metformin and then the aglt2 inhibitors after the approval in, in in by fda in 2014 or like that so we found that there is greater involvement of aglt2 inhibitors in treating uh, diabetic patient so when you combine this together we need uh, a very good diabetes control we need a very effective uh, compliance from the patient and we need a very good cardiovascular outcome and we need a very good renal outcome and also we don't want to exhaust the pancreas and also it should be cost effective so if we consider all these things together so definitely as professor jafar latif start describe that without exhausting the pancreatic beta cell we need some very good combination so what i believe that empagliflozin and metformin combination as it is well described with evidences by dr shahzad salim i also say that yes it is a very good combination regarding uh, you know uh, the patient's uh, side the doctor side and also there are more and more scientific uh, uh, you know evidences so what i believe that today's uh, explanations from dr shahzad salim will help with enable the physicians who are uh, listening to this presentation to choose to select an anti diabetic combination 
especially when they are selecting a non-insulin therapy in such a way that it can help the patient. So it was again a wonderful session. I am very privileged. And also I like to uh, pay my respect to Professor Dr. Zafar Latif, Professor Dr. Shamim Ahmed, and also Professor Dr. Mahibullah. And also I like to say Dr. Shahda Nasadeen, okay, I need more and more presentation from you and also more and more researches in the field so that we can get something new in the future. So, and also again, thank you everybody who are listening to the program. Assalamu alaikum. Good night. Thank you very much, Khan Najat. Now I request Dr. Shami Mohammed to, to comment about this presentation. Dr. Shami Mohammed, please. Uh, thank you, the Chairperson, Honorable Professor Dr. Jafur Lohit, former Director, Bardem, and the Professor <coughs> Mohibullah, former Professor and Director, NICBD, and Professor Khan Abdul Kalam Azad, ex principal and professor, and also the speaker. Shaja Selim. I think the speaker, the chairman is the senior most person in among us. And he, you know, he's a DINAF person. We know him very well, as already described. Professor Principal of Dhaka Medical College is a dynamic person and he has a lot of contribution in a diabetic. Today's his topic is very important, not from cardiovascular point, not, and from, or not only cardiovascular point, not from diabetic point of view, but renal point of view. Because, you know, initially we had been taught that bromonephrite is the first cause of CKD or end-stage renal failure. And nowadays we say that is, when it is the most important cause is the diabetic meltdown because <coughs> it is the first cause, it is epidemic form. And before starting my uh, opinion, I must say Shardaz Salim uh, is an excellent speaker and is a, we are proud of him from Russia. I know him very well. He first called me to be present. And so I'm very grateful and thankful to him that to uh, inviting. And I must say to the Professor Muminul Haq, the managing director of the Channel Pharmaceutical. I don't know whether he's uh, seeing this. We are a good friend in Dhaka Medical College. A long time, we have no face-to-face -face contact, but he is a very uh, good human being, amical person. And he's a, as a, is a managing director of a great pharmaceutical, general pharmaceutical, and also high official uh, of general pharmaceutical for inviting in this one. Now coming to the point of discussion, as you know, this the, today's topic is only because, I will not go into details, empagliproxin and metformin. Because Shahda Chodhi has given a details um, of uh, empagliproxin. You know, we had been in ASN, American Society of Nephrology in San Diego where we the first you know this sodium glucose cotton inhibitor, I think 2017, and also in the Melbourne. So this drug was coming, is a, you saw five or 30 years. Now it is, is a very good drug, as you know. Now let me concentrate on the drug we, they want to highlight. What is the drug? It is sodium glucose cotton inhibitor. You know, it, this is the drug that in the table, you know, the, you have to know, this afferent arterial, which is the branch of interlobular artery, renal artery branch, and the tuft of capillaries and the efferent arterial. I, I just go to, the, as I am kidney man, I must explain, I think there are 44 uh, participants. So this is afferent arterial, the tuft of capillaries and efferent arterial. Why I'm telling, let me say. So this glucose core transporter, uh, sodium glucose transporter, the transporter two and one, as I said rightly, 90% glucose is absorbed in proximal tubule and 10% distal tubule. So what happens in case of diabetes? There is the abnormal, abnormal glomerular tubular feedback mechanism. As you see, there is a hyperglycemia and a hyperfiltration, and there is an injury of the kidney. In, in fact, kidney is damaged because of increased interglomerular pressure. And how, now, how these drug cells? So whenever there is a hyperglycemia, this afferent arterial is dilated. Why? Because of defect in tubular feedback mechanism. So there is a sodium is less. Why? The most of the sodium and glucose is absorbed in the proximal tubule. Less sodium is distal tubule to have an action on macular dancer. So there is a less sodium. Now, what happens when we use these drugs? So they block this sodium glucose co-transporter. So less sodium and less water is absorbed, in the, uh, glucose is absorbed in proximal tubule. 
more so glucose is distal table, delivered to distal table, and the collecting term glucose goes into urine. At the same time, the sodium which goes into distal table, that or regenerate or activate tubular feedback mechanism or autoregulation, thereby they are constricting the afferent artery. And thereby you are just giving less pressure to the glomerular capillaries. So whenever this is less capillary pressure, the filtration will be less, protein will be less, and that is the fundamental uh, principle of action of these drugs, which prevent or reduce the relative risk of nephropathy. And at the same time, let me say, the, on the other hand, efferent arterial, there are the two drugs, renin angiotensin mechanism. So if we use renin angiotensin, either AC inhibitor, receptor blocker, that will dilate the afferent artery, and thereby they'll reduce the interglomerular pressure. So when these two drugs is used together, then kidney is safe. So protein will be less, albumin will be less, and the protection is there. And that is the mechanism of action, how the kidney is safe from these drugs. Now coming, how it acts, you know, the glucose is less, it's absorbed, it is going to down to the urine, so less blood sugar is down. At the same time, water diuresis and sodium is diuresis, blood pressure is less, weight less, weight is also less, so it is a good classical drug. Now, how they prove, as is rightly said, Shajada, that EMPA, that money, REZ, means the removing excess glucose study. This study has two aims. First aim, cardiovascular, and second aim, renal protection. Both has cardiovascular and renal protection. In fact, 1980, FDA approved. If we have to use their drug after metformin, this is the drug sodium glucose transfer. So combination drug will have dual effect, as you know. Now, what, how it, it, what is the target of this study? Target in terms of three things in case of cardiovascular and three things in case of renal. Cardiovascular, what are the three important things? To reduce the MAC, major adverse cardiac event. What is that? Other to reduce this, uh, uh, what is the non-fatal stroke, non-fatal myocardial infarction, and other, other serious effects, and also the cardiac cause of death. And what is the nephropathy in case of diabetic reduction? Relative reduction is, as already said, 48% or 44% relative risk reduction with this duct in nephropathy, reduce the diabetic nephropathy. In terms of what? In terms of progressing to macroalbuminuria, progressing double the serum creatine level, or initiation of the renal replacement therapy or the death from cardio. As you know, the most of the renal patients die due to cardiovascular problem and rather than renal before reaching the stage renal. As rightly says, all the study is done in established cardiovascular disease. Rightly said, Professor Shahjad Salim, all have cardiovascular. So it is a very good drug, can be used. But remember, once you use this drug, as I said, Initially, there is a drop of GFR. So initially, there will be drop of GFR and creatine will be raised. But after four weeks, it will be established and it will be persistent to remain low. Now, the question, how much renal impairment you can use ducts? Initially, it was 45 ml. Now, they accepted it that up to 30 ml GFR, you can use these ducts. At the same time, as you know, metformin. Metformin can be used and if, if the GFR is less than 30, it is better to avoid because of metabolic uh, uh, lactic acidosis. But nowadays, they say, how many cases you have given lactic acidosis for this metformin? So these two combination is an excellent combination in my regards. And these two drugs is a metformin is the first drug of choice, except there is an intolerance, other side effect. And sodium glucose transporter is a very good drug, except severe renal failure, as I said. Only the side effect, sometimes it may cause hypotension and sometimes it may cause uh, 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 some problem. But in, you remember one thing, I have seen some of the patient, blood sugar is controlled, but in urine you can see three plus for glucose. So nothing to be worried because you the blood sugar is passing through the urine. So you have to know, understand this point. Clinical point of view, I just, uh, those who are students and they can understand this very well. So this drug is very good, only you have to see the renal impairment and it's hyper. Sometimes they say the genital infection, rather the UTI, sometimes genital infection is 
is a side effect. But sometimes I see some of the patient has as uh, uric infection to some extent, so you have to handle it carefully. So it, these two combination is a very good drug. So I say this uh, seminar is excellent one, and I highlight because diabetes is a is a disease that causes cardiovascular and that causes renal impairment. And the three main factor is a metabolic factor and this inflammatory factor and hemodynamic factors. These three is well maintained. Not only that, sodium glucose cotransporter has a increase in the, increase the HIV, which is called HIV, so that there is a oxygen consumption is high, that renal tubule. It also has reduced the weight, and also it has other effect in uric acid. It lowers the uric acid level. For all this reason, I think this is a very good drug nowadays, and we are using it in combination with other drugs. So it is a, a excellent opportunity for us to discuss on these drugs and a very good combination. I do not want to take much of time. Maybe some question we can answer with this, uh, with the chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shamir, for your excellent presentation and discussion your comment. Thank you very much. Now I request Dr. Sajada Salim. If there is any question, please read out have, the question and answer. We have some questions from the audience. Can we start, sir? Yes, please. Uh, so, although most of the questions are covered by our respective panelists, so our first question from the audience is, should we be more cautious about starting an SGLT2 inhibitor if the patient has uncontrolled type 2 diabetes for a long period? Like if the patient uh, pancreatic beta cells are likely to have died and there is a risk of diabetic ketosis. So in this case, what should be done? Uh, as the patient is having a uh, blood sugar high, at a high level, uh, the current step forward approach is there if the patient is having HB on C more than 10%. For those patients, there should be a initiation of insulin. Even the patient is having a HB on C lower than that, but the patient were on OEDs for many years. We now, it is uh, agreed that if the patient is having on C or more non-insulin drugs, and HB on C more than 7.5%, the patient should also be initiated with insulin. So the, if the patient is having high blood sugar without insulin, after starting uh, any of the HDLT2 inhibitor, we may invite diabetic ketoacidosis. So if we start empagliprozine or dapagliprozine or canagliprozine in those patients, uh, there should be, uh, uh, at the same time, insulin should be started. Otherwise, uh, catastrophe is waiting for the patient. But uh, if the patient is having HB on C lower than that, or patient is newly detected, HB on C 8%, 8.5 or 9%, 9% for those patients, uh, empagliflozin alone, or empagliflozin or metformin combination is the most preferred option. And uh, again, I showed that according to American Diabetes Association, the patients who are having uh, high risk of cardiovascular uh, events or patient has established cardiovascular events, or the patient is overweight or obese, for those patients, empagliprozine metformin combination is suitable one to start with. Uh, our next question from the audience is, uh, would, you, would we consider withholding SGL2 inhibitor in acute kidney injury uh, or any acute emergency? Uh, for, I'm requesting... Uh, so, Dr. Shami Mahmoud, sir, for uh, You see, you know that you know in acute cases, as a mechanism of action, it will reduce the GFR. So, there will be much, initially, there will be creative rise. So, in that cases, acute cases, it is better to omit than when this acute case is overcome, then you use it. Because otherwise, creative will be raised. So, that is a, a teaching that you should not use in an acute case because you cannot differentiate whether it is progressing to. Uh, high creatine level in after using it. So it is better not to avoid, not to use. Sir, we have that another question. Uh, what diabetic medications can be used when EGFR is less than 30 ml per minute uh, per 1.7 km square? Uh, we have said that is a cutoff point view is 30 ml per minute. Above that, we have used. Below that, it is better not to avoid uh, use it. Initially, it was 45 or 40, but now this they allowed it up to 30. So this has been increased in terms of 
is the FR. Thank you, sir. This is slightly uh, Our next question is uh, among all HG2 inhibitors, which one is superior regarding cardiovascular safety or renal outcomes? Uh, I'm here to do. Yes, Professor Shahzad. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, con con considering the uh, effects, all uh, HDLP2 inhibitors are almost similar. But if we consider to the evidence, uh, this has been achieved by the good conducted studies. I have shown the uh, comparison of several HDL2 inhibitors in several outcomes. In total, uh, empagliflozin is the superior one. But if, if we compare for the uh, reduced injection factor heart failure cases, empagliflozin and dapagliflozin have the evidence. Uh, Canagliflozin did not have. If we consider the weight reduction, the empagliflozin has the moderate weight reduction, but canagliflozin has more than the empagliflozin or dapagliflozin. If we consider the uh, preservation of the renal function, in that, this case, we have the study with the empagliflozin and canagliflozin. So uh, the segregating the patient, the patient's condition, we can uh, choose anyone. But overall, uh, empagliflozin is the, in a better position to select for almost all patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Yes, I do agree with you that empagliflozin is better. These are CANVAS studies show there is no change in albuminemia. But in case of empagliflozin, they reduce, the, uh, uh, reduce this reduction of albuminemia. So empagliflozin is better compared with canagliflozin. The CANVAS study has shown like that. Thank you, sir. Uh, another audience asked about are there any contraindications for to starting these new meds immediately post MI? Is metformin still contraindicated immediately post MI? The question is not clear. Can you repeat it because of your network disturbance? Okay. Yeah, Doctor Doctor Sadia. Yeah, I I, I got it. Yeah, I can. Dr. Sadia, I can read it from the uh, Q&A. Uh, the question is that, uh, can we start uh, this HDLP2 inhibitor immediate after uh, acute MI? Acute MI. Uh, for patients with acute MI, uh, if the patient were on uh, OED and had good glycemic control, even in those cases, the, it is better to start insulin. And for MI patient, it is better to continue insulin for at least six months. After that, we can start. Uh, there is no contraindication or indication regarding starting empagliflozin or other HDL2 inhibitors immediate after acute MI. But uh, we should not uh, uh, we should not do any hurry. Uh, I think, I think, we can wait. I think, I think we can answer this question in other way around. In any acute emergency, in acute emergency, whatever position it may be, we should be careful and insulin is the best option at that time. After settlement of the emergency, we can go back to whatever medication patient can tolerate. Teaching. Teaching. In case of any emergency, no option to uh, try a new medication. Only the safest medication at that time is insulin. Uh, uh, I think, I think uh, lots of questions have been asked. Now it is already 9.30. We shouldn't continue anymore. Uh, sir, we have got lots of questions. So, can I continue uh, two or three questions? Can I take? But it will take an no? unlimited time, huh? Quickly, <laughs> one or two <laughs> questions. Uh, as yes, 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 yes. depletes volume of the body, is it safe for the patient who already taken diuretics or those who are underweight? Uh, what, what, can you repeat this question? Yeah, yeah, I, I got. Let it. me say it is it is yes. found in the study even with this. Sodium glucose transporter, they can use these diuretics. Only thing that you have to use the diuretics long before the drugs. If you use it in the six o'clock, you use it at nine o'clock. So that there will be no interaction in sodium glucose transport uh, pathway. So it is safe, it is safe, but you have to be careful regarding this hypovolemia. And at the same time, you know, the sodium glucose transporter, as I said, hyperkalemia and this acute renal failure. This should be what is found in the, in the placebo group and the, the control group, this study group. There is, it is better 
that in terms of hyper, uh, hyperkalemia and acute renal failure, emphatic study shows that is reduction in that uh, in this group uh, in case of this study group, this men's uh, is better than placebo group. So you can use it safely. Safety is the only thing you have to use in the different times. Thank you. Sir? Am I right? Uh, uh, rightly, you have said another part of the question is that the in the patient with normal weight or underweight, uh, uh, it, it is one of the important that uh, next to GLP-1 receptor agonist to reduce body weight in the patient with type 2 diabetes, but if, if the patient is having a standard weight or underweight, there is no contraindication. We can simply use the drug. Uh, sir, can SGLT2 inhibitor can be given in the first month of Ramadan? Uh, we had several uh, concerns, but the current statement is that during the Ramadan, we should not start the drugs. It is safe to start at least four weeks prior to Ramadan. So if the patient is having uh, the having the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes mellitus immediate before Ramadan, we are not going to start. But the patient who are receiving SGLT2 inhibitor in the full dose, even uh, 25 milligram of amphagiprozin, uh, we can continue this drug, and this drug should be taken during the uh, iftar time. Okay, now I'm taking the last question. Can amphagiprozin uh, be used as monotherapy if metformin is not tolerated by the patient? Uh, it is also important question, I should say. Um, at least 6% of the patients in our country cannot tolerate metformin. And there are uh, adversity found in 10 to 12 percent of patients. So many of the patients cannot tolerate. In those groups, uh, we should try to use any of the uh, insulin centric agents. So next to metformin, we have pyoglitazone in use. So we can uh, try pyoglitazone uh, because for type 2 diabetes mellitus, Zafur Ahmed Bhutishar frequently uh, said that why are not using insulin centric agents? This should be cleared. Because the pathophysiology is there in type 2 diabetes mellitus, the insulin secretory defect is there on the background of insulin resistance. So we have to address insulin uh, resistance. Otherwise, there will be increased chances of cardiovascular disease. But if the patient is having heart failure or uh, increased potentiality of uh, any malignancy, uh, we cannot use pyoglitazone. For those patients, we can consider. Otherwise, we have to select uh, pyoglitazone if the patient cannot tolerate metformin. Uh, the, if the patient cannot tolerate both of the sensitizer, we can, for those patients okay. only, we yeah. can also give them the Salim, you are in network problem. Let me add with it. Yes, FDA has given this approval in case of established cardiovascular disease or a diabetic, you can use this drug as a first choice. There is FDA has given 19, 2018, this approval is already given. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, our respective panelists and Mr. Peterson, sir, for a very. Uh, I think time is up. I think chairman will say something more. Okay. Now I would like to invite Mr. Jahiduddin Choudhury, National Sales Manager, General Pharmaceuticals Limited, for the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, honorable chairperson of today's live webinar program, infagliflozidin metformin fixed dose combination. This is the new horizon in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Professor Dr. Jafar Lukip, sir, the honorable former honorable director general of Bardem, mm -hmm. learned keynote speakers of today's program, Dr. Shahzada Selim, associate professor, Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism, PSMI. Respected panel of experts, Professor Dr. A.K.M. Mohibullah, sir, is the ex director of NICBD, President Bangladesh Cardiac Society, and vice president APSC. Professor Dr. Shami Mohammed Sir, renowned nephrologist of Bangladesh, who is the ex-director of NIGDU. Professor Dr. Khan Abul Kalamazad Sir, the legendary medicine specialist of Bangladesh, the ex-principal and professor Raga, Raga Medical College. Respected all other dignitaries and distinguished participants on Zoom platform as well as like Facebook, like Facebook page. Very good evening and assalamu alaikum. On behalf of myself and general pharma management, I would like to pay my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to all of you for your patience sharing and your cordial participation. This program makes successful one, which will be inspired us to arrange such program in the coming days. Dear sir, 
all you know that as quality is the first priority of general pharma every step of manufacturing procedure we maintain very strictly and collect all the raw materials from best sources of the world which continuation of today's discussed generic infoglyphosylin general pharma is the only company of bangladesh who are using poland whole pharma raw materials of poland and this general pharma using their brand emphosen m in european infoglyphosylin as a result with the affordable cost for your patients as a result we have achieved your trust and confidence on our product which is the great strength for us general pharma due to quality of its product at present exporting their medicine 30 countries of the world here i can assure that the standard and quality of product we are exporting various part of the part of the world the same standard and quality product we are offering domestic patients that is for your patients we firmly believe that beyond the your support a pharma company that we never can for move forward so sir from my core of heart i would like to request please come keep continue your support in favor of our general pharma quality product especially on today's discussed product our infosen and infosen m we are very much thankful and grateful to the to the chair person and panel of guests for your valuable time as well as valuable comments and speakers let us say sadat the selim sir for his brilliant presentation always general pharma always beside of you with the best possible professional service and please keep in keep continue your supporting our general quality product stay safe you and your family thank you very much again assalam alaikum allah hafiz Dear audience, uh, we are at the very end of today's session. May I now request over to the Honorable Chairperson, Professor Dr. Jafar Lutfi Sir, for his concluding remarks and closing the session. Absolutely. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. General Pharma for organizing this beautiful scientific session on metformin empagliflozin combination therapy. Before giving any concluding remark. i like to express my sympathy to the families and also pray for the departed soul of our colleagues who are lost their life during this pandemic situation and also pray on the recovery of all my colleagues and friends who are still suffering in the health sector services and i wish them all the recovery and i wish all other colleagues be safe in this situation that we are now encountering now, now then i would like to express my thanks to my friends and colleagues who spoke in this occasion my student for the presentation ak mohibullah cardiologist khan abul kalam azad a good person i know i like him personally very much and dr shami mahmed is i know him lastly i want to say regarding one thing regarding this medication you will have to remember dr shahadat salim asked about the uh, uh, side effects of the medication of empagliflozin one of the thing is the recurrent uti candida disease all this thing is usually famous are usually suffering more but i say so i can assure you that as we are using wet hygiene not like that of dry hygiene of the western society the prevalence of this sort of uti or this sort of things would be less in our country because we use wet hygiene that is very important last of all which medication is best is no medication is best no medication is worst we can have to remember five important point while whenever we prescribe medication i i say first of all we shall have to consider the age of the patient and what age what type of patient then we shall have to think of associated condition of the patient ckd stages of ckd any other acute complication pregnancy 
no weight bar to uh, no body weight definitely those who are losing weight body weight we are not going to prescribe this sort of medication considering all this aspect as a physician as a clinician we shall be should be the best judge to prescribe the right medication to our patient so they can be benefited so considering all this thing we should think of the thing that then we shall have to prescribe to our patient thank you very much organizer for asking me to chair this particular session thank you all all i wish that all of us in will be healthy and be safe and allah will grant us will be very merciful upon us thank you very much thank you very much sir for your valuable opinion uh, now i would like to convey our heartiest thanks on behalf of general pharmaceuticals limited for uh, being uh, with us in this program uh, so thank you once again and goodbye stay safe thank you